My incognito is exploded. After a close study of the face of the pilot on watch, I was satisfied that I'd never seen him before, so I went up there. The pilot inspected me, I re-inspected the pilot. These customary preliminaries over, I sat down on the high bench, and he faced about and went on with his work. Every detail of the pilot house was familiar to me with one exception, a large mouth tube under the breastboard. I puzzled over that thing a considerable time, then gave up and asked what it was for, to hear the engine bells through. It was another good contrivance, which ought to have been invented half a century sooner. So I was thinking when the pilot asked, do you know what this rope is for? I managed to get around this question without committing myself. Is this the first time you've ever been in a pilot house? I crept under that one. Where are you from? New England? First time you ever been west? I climbed over this one. If you take an interest in such things, I can tell you what all these things are for. I said I should like it. This, putting his hand on a backing bell rope, is to sound the fire alarm. This, putting his hand on the go-ahead bell, is to call the Texas tender. This one, indicating the whistle lever, is to call the captain. And so he went on, touching one object after another and reeling off his tranquil spool of lies. I had never felt so like a passenger before. I thanked him with emotion for each new fact and wrote it down in my notebook. The pilot warmed to his opportunity and proceeded to load me up in a good old-fashioned way. At times I was afraid he was going to rupture his invention. But it always stood the strain and he pulled through all right. He drifted by easy stages into revealments of the river's marvelous eccentricities of one sort and another and backed them up with some pretty gigantic illustrations. For instance, you see that little boulder sticking out of the water yonder? Well, when I first came on the river, that was a solid ridge of rock over 60 feet high and two miles long, all washed away but that. I had a mighty impulse to destroy him, but it seemed to me that killing in an ordinary way would be too good for him. Once, when an odd-looking craft with a vast coal scuttle slanting aloft on the end of a beam was steaming by in the distance, he indifferently drew attention to it as one might of an object grown wearisome through familiarity, and observed that it was an alligator boat. An alligator boat? What's it for? To dredge out alligators with. Are they so thick as to be troublesome? Well, not now, because the government keeps them down, but they used to be. Not everywhere, but in favorite places here and there, where the river is wide and show like Plum Point and Stack Island and so on. Places they call alligator beds. Did they actually impede navigation? Yes, years ago, yes, in very low water. There was hardly a trip then that we didn't get aground on alligators seemed to me that I should certainly have got out my tomahawk. However, I restrained myself and said, It must have been dreadful. Yes, it was one of the main difficulties about piloting. It was so hard to tell anything about the water. The damn things kept shifting around, never lie still five minutes at a time. You could tell a wind reef straight off by the look of it. You could tell a break. You could tell a sand reef. All that's easy. But an alligator reef don't show up worth anything. Nine times in ten you can't tell where the water is. So when you do see it where it is, it's like as not it ain't there when you get there and the devils have swapped around so meantime. Of course there are some few pilots that could judge alligator water nearly as well as they could any other kind. But they had to have a natural talent for it. It wasn't a thing a body could learn. You had to be born with it. Let me see. There was Ben Thornburg and Beck Jolly and Squire Bell, Horace Bixby and Major Downing and John Stevenson and Billy Gordon. 
and Jim Brady and George Ehler and Billy Youngblood, all A1 alligator pilots. They could tell alligator water as far as another Christian could tell whiskey. Read it? Ah, oh, couldn't they, though? I only wish I had as many dollars as they could read alligator water a mile and a half off. Yes, and it paid them to do it, too. A good alligator pilot could always get $1,500 a month. Nights, other people had to lay up for alligators, but those fellows never laid up for alligators. They never laid up for anything but fog. They could smell the best alligator water, it was said. I don't know whether it was so or not, and I think a body's got his hands full enough if he sticks to just what he knows himself without going around backing up other people's say so. Though there's plenty that ain't backward about doing it, as long as they can roust out something wonderful to tell, which is not the style of Robert Stiles by as much as three fathom, maybe quarter less. My, was this Rob Stiles? This mustached and stately figure, a slim enough cub in my time. How he has improved in comeliness in five and twenty years, and in the noble art of inflating facts. After these musings, I said aloud, I should think that dredging out the alligators wouldn't have done much good because they could have come back right away again. If you'd had as much experience of alligators as I have, you wouldn't talk like that. You dredge an alligator once, and he's convinced it's the last you hear of him. He wouldn't come back for pie. If there's one thing that an alligator's more down on than any other, it's being dredged. Besides, they were not simply shoved out of the way, and most of them scooped or scooped aboard. They emptied them into the hole, and when they got a trip, they took them to uh, New Orleans to the government works. What for? Why, to make soldier shoes out of their hides. All the government shoes are made of alligator hide. Makes the best shoes in the world. They last five years and they won't absorb water. The alligator fishery is a government monopoly. All the alligators are government property. Just like live oaks. You cut down a live oak and the government finds you fifty dollars. You kill an alligator and you go up for misprison of treason. Lucky duck if you don't hang you, too. And they will if you're a Democrat. The buzzard is the sacred bird of the South, and you can't touch him. The alligator is the sacred bird of the government, and you got to let him alone. Well, do you ever get around on alligators now? Oh, no, it hasn't happened for years. Well, then, why do you still keep alligator boats in service? Just for police duty, nothing more. They merely go up and down now. Present generation alligators know them as easy as burglar knows a roundsman. When they see one coming, they break camp and go for the woods. After rounding out and finishing up and polishing off the alligator business, he dropped easily and comfortably into the historical vein and pulled of some tre tremendous feats of half a dozen old-time steamboats of his acquaintance, dwelling at special length upon a certain extraordinary performance of his chief favorite among his distinguished fleet, and then adding, that boat was the Cyclone. Last trip she ever made, she sunk. That very trip, Captain was Tom Ballou, the most immortal liar that ever I struck. He couldn't even seem to tell the truth in any kind of weather. Why, he'd make you fairly shudder. He was the most scandalous liar. I left him finally. I couldn't stand it. The proverb says, like master, like man. And if you stay with that kind of man, you'll come under suspicion by and by, and just as sure as you live. He paid first-class wages, but said I, what's wages when your reputation's in danger? So I let the wages go and froze my reputation. And I've never regretted it. Reputation's worth everything, ain't it? That's the way I look at it. He had more selfish organs than any seven men in the world, all packed with the stern sheets of his skull, of course, where they belonged. They weighed down the back of his head so that it made his nose tilt up in the air. People thought it was a vanity, but it wasn't. It was malice. 
If you only saw his foot, you'd take him to be 19 feet high, but he wasn't. It was because his foot was out of drawing. He was intended to be 19 feet high, no doubt, if his foot was made first, but he didn't get there. He was only 5 feet 10. That's what he was. That's what he is. You take the lies out of him and he'll shrink to the size of your hat. You take the malice out of him and he'll disappear. That cyclone was a rattler to go and the sweetest thing to steer that ever walked the waters. Set her amidships in the big river and just let her go. It was all you had to do. She would hold herself on a star all night if you let her alone. You could never feel her rudder. It wasn't any more labor to steer her than it was to count the Republican vote in the South Carolina election. One morning just at daybreak, the last trip she ever made, they took her rudder aboard to mend it. I didn't know anything about it. I backed her out of the wood yard and went a-weaving down the river all serene. When I'd gone about 23 miles and made four horribly crooked crossings, without any rudder? Yeah. Old Captain Tom appeared on the roof and began to find fault with me for running such a dark night. Such a dark night? Why, you said, never mind what I said. T'was as dark as Egypt now, though pretty soon the moon began to rise. And You mean the sun, because you started out just the break of... Look here, was this before you quitted the captain on account of his lying, or... It was before, oh, a long time before, and as I was saying, he... But was this trip she sunk, or was, oh no, months afterwards? And so the old man, he, then he made two last trips, because you said, he stepped back from the wheel, swabbing away his perspiration, and said, Here, calling me by name, you take her and lie a while. You're handier at it than I am, trying to play yourself for a stranger and an innocent. way I knew you before you had spoken seven words, and I made up my mind, find out what was your game and was to draw me out well I let you didn't I now take the wheel and finish the watch and next time play fair you won't have to work for your passage thus ended the fictitious name business and not six hours out from St. Louis but I would gained a privilege anyway for I'd been itching to get my hands on the wheel from the beginning I seem to have forgotten the river but I hadn't forgotten how to steer a steamboat now how to enjoy it either.